Welcome to Section 2, DynamoDB DNS and Application Services Exam Prep. In this section, we will cover DynamoDB Recap, tables, indexes, queries, and scans, as well as some other fundamental DynamoDB concepts, Route 53 Recap with DNS routing types and how to configure them, SQS, SNS, and SWF Recap, CloudFormation Recap, Elastic Beanstalk Recap, as well as we will introduce some exam tips, and we will have a summary and quiz to validate the knowledge. DynamoDB Recap Tables, Indexes, Queries, and Scans In this video, we will recap the most important aspects of DynamoDB. DynamoDB is a fast, scalable, and fully managed NoSQL database service. It provides both a key value as well as a document store. The main fundamental concepts around DynamoDB are tables, which represent collections of data, items, which are individual entries in your table, think of them as rows, as, as well as attributes, which are the properties associated with the entries, and think of them as columns. So each item can have multiple different attributes, and items are contained within tables. Dynamo uses SSDs to store the data. It provides automatic and synchronous data replication across three facilities in a region. The maximum item size is 400 kilobytes, and DynamoDB supports cross-region replication. There are two different types of consistency supported with DynamoDB. We have the default consistency type, which is the eventual consistent reads. It maximizes the read throughput, but it will take approximately one second for the data to be replicated to all the facilities. So you might need to repeat the read to actually get the newest data. Strongly consistent reads signify that the result will reflect all the writes that got a successful response before the read was made. But it will take a bit more time and it won't maximize the read throughput for you. The best one is to use eventual consistent reads if you want to maximize the read throughput. Otherwise, strongly consistent reads depends on how sensitive your application is going to be, if you require the latest data, or you can have a one second delay. And then we have primary keys that we need to talk about. We can have the situation where we have one attribute primary key. This is called a partition key, also known as a hash attribute. It must be unique within the table. Or we can have two attributes forming a primary key, or think about this as a composite primary key. It is made of one partition key, or a hash key, and one sort key, or a range key. You can have items in, with the same partition key, but their sort items must differ. And with partition keys, NMODB is going to use them as inputs to a hash function to determine where the objects need to be stored. And if we're using a composite key, the keys are going to be sorted. The sort keys are going to be sorted in order on that particular partition. Then we need to remember that each primary key attribute must hold a single value. That is, it can only be a string number of, or binary, it can't have sets or lists or anything that contains multiple elements as your primary key. Then we have uh, secondary indexes. So we have two different types. We have the local secondary index, or LSI, which has the same partition key as the table, but a different sort key. And it can only be created when you create the table. And you can have a maximum of five LSIs per table. Then there is the global secondary index where you can have a partition or a partition and sort key that can be different from the tables ones. You can create a global secondary index when you create the table or any time afterwards. And you can have a maximum of five GSIs per table. 
Then there are DynamoDB streams, which records data modification events in DynamoDB tables. It stores this information in log for up to 24 hours. It's near real time and on the create update delete of an item in the table, DynamoDB streams writes a stream record with the primary key attributes of that item. And you can use streams to do other uh, processing of your DynamoDB items. For example, you might want to trigger a Lambda that will do some post-processing afterwards and might send out an SMS, um, an SMS message to your users or an email. You can schedule all of that using DynamoDB streams as your mechanism. Then we have scans and these will get all items and attributes by performing a full scan across the table or a secondary index. Afterwards, it filters out values to return the wanted result, which will mean that you will get an extra step. And we have seen with scans that you will have to provide the um, partition key. And then you can start the scan and it will go through all your table but you can limit the return set by specifying filters against one or more attributes, that is a filter expression, or the attributes to include, which will be a projection expression. But the bigger the table, the slower the scan will get because it will need to look at every single item in that particular table. So as a best practice, you should think about using queries instead of scans. And queries allow you to retrieve one or more items using the table primary key or from a secondary index using the index key. For a query, you need to specify a partition key and a search value. Optionally, you can specify a sort key, so you can use different comparisons for your sort key. It will return all attributes of the matched values, but you can use projection expressions for, to retrieve a subset. You can also filter the query results using filters on non-key attributes, for example, filter expressions. You should always think about using queries for uh, retrieving your data. Between a query and a scan, queries are going to be much more effective. Then we looked at additional operations for DynamoDB. The most relevant ones are batch get item, which gives you a maximum of 100 items from the table or um, 16 megabytes. Batch write item gives you a maximum of 25 put item or delete item requests, 16 megabytes. The scrambled limits for a region is used to obtain the current account limits on the provision capacity. Then we talked about conditional writes where by default the write operations put item, update item, delete item will overwrite an existing item that has the wanted primary key, but you can prevent this behavior using conditional writes. The write will be successful if and only if the item attributes meet the specified conditions. And what you need to remember with conditional writes is that they are item potent. That it is if you retry to do the same operation more than once, no further effect will take place if it has already been applied. If the condition is not met, you'll get a conditional check failed exception. And then we talked about atomic counters, which use update item API to increment or decrement a numeric attribute unconditionally, and it will not interfere with other write requests. Write requests are applied in the order that they are received. And with atomic counters, you need to remember that they are not idempotent. They are going to be applied every time that they are called. So if you apply the same operation multiple times, you're going to have your uh, value increased or decreased depending on um, what you have specified the same amount of times as your request has been made. So this is not an item potent operation. It's going to have side effects. It is useful when over or under counting can be tolerated. For example, page views, but you wouldn't, you shouldn't be using atomic counters for any 
banking or financial data or anything that is quite sensitive. Then we looked at provisioned throughput and we know that one read capacity unit is four kilobytes or one consistent read or two eventually consistent reads per second. And we have one write capacity unit is one kilobyte or one write per second. And let's recap how we can actually calculate um, RCUs. So let's say we have an application that needs to perform 45 read operations per second and each item size is two kilobytes. What is the read capacity that you should set given that the app will use the eventual consistency model? And we remember with RCUs, we get the item size rounded up to the next four kilobyte chunk. We divide it by four kilobytes and then we multiply it by the number of items. So in our case, the item size is two kilobytes and we have a number of items of 45. We round up to the next four kilobyte chunk. So we take two kilobytes and we round it up to the next four kilobyte chunk. This means four kilobytes. So we will then divide four kilobytes by four kilobytes and multiply with the number of items that is 45. So we'll have one multiplied by 45 and we'll get 45 RCUs. And these are strongly consistent reads. So to get the eventual consistent model or eventual consistent reads, we have to divide by two. So we'll get 45 divided by two, this is 22.5. But because we can't have any non-integer type of RCUs, we're only allowed integers, we will have to round it up to the next RCU available. And that is going to be 23. Then we looked at different provision throughput for LSIs and GSIs. And we know that local secondary indexes use the parents table, tables RCUs and WCUs. And we know that strongly consistent reads and eventually consistent reads are supported with LSIs. And when an item in the table is added, updated or deleted, updating the LSI will consume provisioned write capacity units for the table. With GSIs or global secondary indexes, we have separate read capacity units and write capacity units. Only ECR or eventually consistent reads are supported. That is, you're going to get a maximum of eight kilobytes per RCU. And when an item in a table is added, updated, or deleted, and a GSI is affected, the GSI will consume provisioned write capacity units for the operation. Then the last part is around provisioned throughput errors. That is, we'll have a 400 HTTP status code for provisioned throughput exceeded exceptions. And this is going to happen for requests that exceed RCUs and or WCUs for the table. Or if GSIs are used, all GSIs must have enough WCUs or else throttling will happen. Then we spoke about Web Identity Federation, where a user will authenticate with the identity provider, for example, Facebook, Google, or Amazon. The provider will return a Web Identity token after authenticating the user, and your application will call the Assume role with Web Identity STS API and provide this Web Identity token. And STS will return security credentials that will allow access to DynamoDB. 15 minutes to 60 minutes, and by default, it is going to allow that particular user through the application that we specified to access the Dynamo table for 60 minutes.